Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today to talk about working with unreliable data. I'm excited to be here today calling in from New York City, and I hope you are enjoying your PyCon experience so far. As you can see from the rest of the title and the title that I've chosen for myself, this presentation is really a collection of learning and observation that I've had while working with data in and around open source projects. I put this together in the hopes that we can learn from this experience together and as a community create better and more standard practices in and around using data around open source projects. If you have any questions for me after the fact, please don't hesitate to reach out on Twitter. A little bit more about myself, I started my career as a market researcher as, and a technology consultant working with various different types of data and sources. And now as a program manager within Google's open source programs office, I work with a lot of contribution behavior in and around open source projects on questions like metrics, reporting, and project health. And throughout all of these various roles and exercises, I've come to the conclusion that data is an are inherently messy and every data set has its own series and sets of flaws, whether or not those are systemic or driven by humans who design the systems. So you could have limitations on where and when data is actually collected or reported, could be various gaps in reporting or inconsistencies in year-over-year -year metrics. If you've ever worked with surveys, you typically are only looking at a subset of the population that is capable of answering the questions that you've presented to them. But then you're also dealing with the individual who's taking your survey, who if they've had a really bad day and you give them a question that asks about their satisfaction or experience with a particular tool, they might just not want to like anything and that's okay and that's due to the nature of the survey itself. When we work with data in and around open source projects, there's additional ambiguity due to the nature of what even is an open source project. Licensing aside, it could be a code base, it could be a data set, a framework, a model, a design, a series of designs and processes. I work with the chaos community where we talk about metrics and standard language to define those metrics in and around open source projects. And as much variety as there is in even de the definition of a project, we see even more variety in how we might even contribute to it. Throughout this presentation, I will be adding links for suggested reading and adjacent topics. Here I'm linking a report from the University of Vermont that looked at various types of contribution attribution modeling from existing data sources and methods. To put it in more of a practical case, say we want to design a metrics program or analyze contribution behavior around a specific project we are going to have to establish a boundary of what we're talking about as part of that project. Say in a software project, we're looking at a code base, a set of documentation, a community of actors, maintainers, users, contributors, and a series of dependencies, code bases, libraries, packages, infrastructure for build and test, funding, investments. We could probably keep adding to this model depending on all the various spaces that project activity happens. Now, in a more practical sense, say you are presented with the GitHub, a GitHub activity stream, a webhook or event stream, whatever you're working with, and now you're asked to produce a series of metrics or reports around a particular project. Now you have to define what the project looks like in that specific source. So in the GitHub example, it's probably a series of organizations and repositories that maybe you can see how they're related by name and convention alone, and maybe you can't. Um, you'll have a set of GitHub actors that are interacting with those various repositories and organizations. And then anything you can learn from the various schema, tags, and metadata that are embedded in the payload or in other elements coming out of the APIs. Now I said all of this to mention the fact that this might not be clearly documented. Um, I've worked with a number of project communities where I had to reach out to an individual to verify, am I counting the correct repositories? as part of this project or should these other pieces be part of a satellite or an adjacent community and how those nuances and boundaries are defined. I said all of this to acknowledge the fact that anytime you are pursuing analysis around a project, you're most likely going to be dealing with a set of sources that are only representing a subset of all of the activity that can happen around a project. Just think about outside of GitHub, there are events and spaces, wikis, forums, websites, where other types and styles and modes of activity and contribution can take place. 
Now, once we've set our boundary, we've set our sources, we also have to deal with inconsistencies within the data sets themselves that might thwart what we can learn or assume from the data that we see. But in essence, what we're counting is always subject to whatever schema and log events that we're collecting from whatever sources or APIs. And we can assume that we have all of them because if you say work with GitHub, there's a rate limit in place for how many times you can call an API in a given day. So if you are extracting large amounts of information from this platform, you might be missing some um, from either dropped logs or missing data. When you count something impacts what you count. And this is really applicable for, more applicable for longer standing projects that have had many branches and forks over the years. And as time goes on, some of those forks might get merged back into the main branch. In which case, all the history around that fork now becomes part of the history of the project. So if you say five years ago, pulled a bunch of data and ran a series of queries against that information set, and then five years later, pulled the same historical piece of information, you might see different counts. You might see different metrics show up when you actually run those queries again. The last point I want to make here is how you're counting something. And this is due to the nature that we can't necessarily assume that one account is one person. We might have multiple accounts per person that may or may not be named or unknown. And then we could have bots that are known or unknown or scripts, and automated scripts running from personal accounts. In the last couple of years working with this data, I've had a harder time even distinguishing what activity I would even attribute to a human. To put this in the kind of scale, I, did a, I ran a basic query to identify the amount of activity being generated by known bots on GitHub. Here I'm looking at a query against GitHub Archive where I borrowed a list from the DevStats project to identify a series of known bots actors on GitHub. And in this query, we found that 43 million pull request events were attributed to these known bots, representing about 47% of all pull request events logged in 2021. So this is quite substantial, and as you can see from the trajectory on the chart, this seems to be growing exponentially. And this is just the activity generated from known bots versus scripts coming out of human-based accounts. The next area of conversation I want to bring up is accountability. When we work with data in and around open source projects, there might not necessarily be a clear accountability structure. In contrast, if you work for a company, Every company has a series of explicit policies and regulations as it pertains to employee data, customer data, business data, revenue data, all the various regulations that are coming from governments and regulatory bodies that influence what those policies are and what companies can and cannot do with that information. Working with project communities, governing models are set by the communities themselves and the leaders within those communities. And so it's up to them to establish individual policies and practices around how they handle data. I'd like to raise this because within open source project data, there's an incredible amount of personally identifiable information, whether or not that's your public GitHub account or the email you use to sign your commits. And so if you're thinking about it from the perspective of an undefined set of policies and regulations, then maybe you have to start from scratch and think through all the various choices and layers that go into where data is being collected and who it's being handled by. So starting from the generator of that information, the user or contributor who shares or doesn't share their personal information, chooses what platform to opt into and which one to not. Then the platforms themselves define data usage policies and regulatory requirements that they're beholden to. For using various aggregation tools that collect data from those various platforms, then they might have their own policies and regulations as well as inherit everything that came from the platforms that they're interacting with. And then as the aggregating entity, the collector is responsible for infrastructure selection, data storage, and regulatory requirements that pertain to those specific localities. And these again could be set by corporations, governments, private entities, or even coming out of the project community or leadership. An example here I've put in the Chaos Community's data policy that we have in place that shows community members and participants how we plan to manage the data that they share with us and set expectations for how we will maintain it over time. 
So as a bit of homework, if you're about to pursue an analysis project that involves collecting and aggregating data where it hasn't been collected and aggregated before, perhaps it's wise to think through what terms and policies that data set would be subject to, whether or not there are various licenses, policies, documentation coming from the project platform company or regional regulators. Now I said all of this and you might go through this exercise and you might not find anything. And that's okay because it might not be defined. But if you're collecting data where it hasn't been collected before and you might feel like you've stepped beyond what users or contributors are expecting individuals to collect about them, then perhaps this might be a case to create a privacy statement or create some sort of data policy around how you intend to maintain, regulate, and protect this information. I want to close with a couple of recommendations for fellow analysts. And here, anyone who talks about data, I consider an analyst in this case. And so when we're dealing with a particularly messy kind of data, I think we need additional precision in how we describe and talk about this information. Say, always state what we're counting. One of the useful rubrics that I like to use is, can someone else recreate this metric by how you've described it? And this might yield some fairly clunky sentence structure. And so perhaps if that's a concern to you, consider a glossary. Say, define the things that you're counting. Things like contribution and engagement can have a variety of meanings depending on the sources that you're using and the metrics that you're creating. And as a general good practice, always state your sources. And in this case, this includes the methodology, any assumptions that you've made to get to your subject, any bias or boundaries that you've drawn around the existing data sources to make this an executable problem versus something in theory. If you work in the academic community, there are various rigorous ways that folks are required to document this within a particular paper. If you're looking for more of a flexible format in a non-structured environment, I included an about this data in a blog post that I wrote last year. The last thing I want to leave you with is a recommendation to always share with a purpose. Data can be an incredibly valuable tool to incite a change, to provide more context, to provide feedback, to showcase what is happening outside of what folks can see in front of them. And this is, again, a very powerful tool, but also can incentivize a change. And typically, that's maybe why you're showing it in the first place. But when we're talking about data in and around open source communities, you might be showcasing data about real people. And those people could be named in it, say, in the event of a leaderboard or ranked list of companies or individuals, in which case publishing that you might be inadvertently incentivizing a specific behavior. Say, if you're counting com contributions as the number of open pull requests and you're ranking individuals by that metric, you've potentially encouraged them to submit more pull requests and, say, break up a pull request into multiple changes versus one individual pull request. So is that the behavior you wanted to drive by publishing that metric? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so mostly just, again, to think about what you might get from sharing this information and always share it with a goal or purpose in mind. Thank you very much for your time today. And again, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or follow-ups.